Despite the restrictions, Dukas Clanacilty Heritage remained very busy during the pandemic years of 2020-2021. We embraced technology and used it to communicate in new ways with our members. Our lecture series, for example, was very well received and enjoyed by members in many parts of the world. For Heritage Week 2021, we have decided to do a video recording. Our first visit is to Lysolan House and Gardens, once the home of the infamous landlord William Benz Jones and subsequently the residence of C.O. Stanley, the industrialist. Our second visit is to the medieval church and graveyard of Kilgariff, where many generations of Clannacilty families lie buried. Our third and final port of call is to the coastal village of Ring, with its rich maritime history and a nearby graveyard at Ballin Temple. We hope you enjoy listening to the stories and spectacular view of these sites. Here at Lissalan House, near Clannacilty, West Cork, this beautiful fairy tale house with its terrace gardens sloping down to the banks of the Aragadine River belies a dark early history. It was designed by renowned English architect Louis Vomay in a French chateau style for William Benz Jones, a man who to this day is reviled by many in West Cork. He became an overnight sensation on the national and international press by being the first landed estate owner to be boycotted during the Irish Land Wars in December of 1880. History is far from complimentary to Benz Jones, who was regarded as a rack-renting, exterminating landlord in addition to being branded a religious and racial bigot. However, he was a complex character and with the passage of time deserves further investigation. Born in Suffolk in 1812, educated in Harrow and Oxford, Ben Jones was called to the bar in 1837 and seemed destined to have a lucrative law career in England. However, he inherited an estate of 2,000 acres in West Cork, which had been purchased by his grandfather and having discovered that the land agent was taking more than his fair share of the rent roll, he decided to take on the management of the estate himself. Both his father and grandfather had been what he himself called benevolent absentee landlords, and the estate was thoroughly neglected. In contrast to many landed estates, Lissa land was not acquired through confiscation or plantation, but was purchased at various times. Old William Jones, the first owner, never saw his estate and his son, also named William, visited but once. According to Benz Jones, when he arrived in 1838, the area was a most desolate and barren wasteland. In 1843, he married Caroline Dickinson, the daughter of William Dickinson, MP, and moved full-time to Haliska an estate of 886 acres, until in 1853, when he moved to the newly built Lissalan house with his wife and large family. Benz Jones embarked on a system to improve the estate, develop a model farm and teach tenants the benefits of crop rotation and use of manures. The estate management was overhauled while agents and bailiffs were sacked. According to himself, the results were spectacular as crops grew like never before. Arrears of rents were waived, but tenants were put on notice that further rents must be paid on pain of immediate eviction. He introduced the binding principle that every man should fulfill whatever contract he made. On this he proved unyielding and unforgiving. The first tenant who fell foul, described by Ben Jones, as a lazy schemer as ever lived and a Protestant, was evicted and his land turned into a model farm. Within a few short years, the Great Famine would convulse the country. But under his new regime, Benz Jones claimed his tenants were well insulated against the famine and withstood the calamity better than most. To give him credit, he also set up a fever hospital in Clonakilty during the famine. As a consequence of the famine, and poor management, many ascendancy landlords were declared bankrupt. 
This facilitated enterprising landowners like Benz Jones, who seized the opportunity to increase their estates through the encumbered estate court established in 1849. In the next decade, Benz Jones doubled his estate to 4,000 acres. But after the famine, rents due were punctually enforced by him and defaulters immediately evicted a policy he cunningly used to his advantage, claiming that the evicted tenant got no sympathy from his neighbors as they could gain from the eviction. Benz Jones proved to be a formidable and controversial figure in and around Clonakilty. In 1853, the clamor for railways were heard in many parts, including Clonakilty, when an extension to the Bandon line was proposed at a cost of 5,000 pounds per mile. This project caused major division among landowners, with Lord Carberry in favour and Benz Jones strongly opposed, arguing that the burden placed on proprietors was much too severe. Benz Jones got his way. While the railway extension from Bandon through Dunmanway and Drimaleague to Skibbereen proceeded, the line to Clonakilty did not. This decision caused outrage. In this controversy, Benz Jones dealt a serious blow to the progress of Clonakilty, and a generation passed before the railway was again seriously considered. In subsequent years, he clashed with luminaries of business, church and state, but his first great personal showdown was with John Calnan, an elected member of Clonakilty Board of Guardians. As a magistrate, Benz Jones became an ex officio member of the Board of Guardians, when the Clonakilty Poor Law Union was set up in 1849, he was determined to cut spending to the detriment of the poor inmates of the workhouse. John Calnan claimed Benz Jones and other landlords were the real promoters of oppression, while deliberately and systematically keeping inmates on inadequate diets. The matter came to a head at a meeting of the Board of Guardians in June of 1856, when Benz Jones charged that he wouldn't be blackguarded any more, to which Calnan retorted, am I to consider Mr. Jones call me a blackguard? I call Mr. Jones a liar, a scoundrel and a coward. Benz Jones sued for libel, claiming that Calnan held him up to the odium and ill will of the inmates and the general public. It boiled over at a mass meeting held to consider the town's improvement act. And on polling day, a mob surrounded him while a coffin prepared for him was kicked to pieces and it took the intervention from the parish priest to save him from possible death. In 1850s, Benz Jones generously financed the building of a new Protestant church in Kilmaluda. He later saw the disestablishment of the Church of Ireland as an opportunity to rid the church of huge inefficiencies and suggested unions of parishes run on business principles raising its own finance with limited state support. In 1862, he contributed 500 pounds to the refurbishment of St. Finbar's Cathedral, but with certain conditions attached. These conditions resurfaced to torment him 20 years later. The West Cork Eagle alleged that Benz Jones attempted to bribe Bishop Craig with 5,000 pounds for the rebuilding of the cathedral on condition that no Catholic or Irishman be employed as architect. Other clashes occurred. A number of libel cases included one with the Cork Butter Market, another with the editor of the Protestant newspaper Cork Constitution, and yet another with a Wesleyan schoolmaster in Clonakilty. He had a dispute with his neighbour, Thomas Poole of Mayfield, on the poisoning of the Cashelmore hounds, and he also evicted a Protestant tenant for supporting John Calnan in getting elected to the Board of Guardians. However, by the late 1870s, some 40 years after his arrival in West Cork, it appeared he was mellowing. He and his wife Caroline hosted a lavish party where up to 50 tenants were wined and dined in Lissalan House. Benz Jones told the tenants what goodwill he felt towards them and that he and his wife felt prosperous and happy. He was now farming 2,000 acres, and the home farm carried 100 milking cows, in addition to 800 other livestock. Alarm bells rang at Lesselan in 1878, 
when profits from his own enterprise plummeted with a further decrease in 1879. When a branch of the Land League was founded in Clonakilty in August of 1880, this spelt further trouble for Ben Jones. Some of his rents were double and even treble the amount of Griffith's valuation, and tenants were instructed by the Land League to offer only Griffiths. When Ben Jones was unwilling to compromise, an unpleasant impasse prevailed that swiftly moved to a full-scale boycott. The Cork Examiner reported that by the 13th of December, none of his 30 labourers were working for him. His oats could not be sold at Bandon Fair. No provisions could be purchased from the shopkeepers of Clonakilty or Ballinascarthy. Shipping companies refused to carry his cattle and sheep. Ben Jones' daughter Lily wrote to her sister Carrie, complaining that her arms were weak with milking and that poor Willie's back and neck were quite doubled over from their new life of drudgery. Now, Father John O'Leary, a newly elected chairman of the Clonakilty Land League, entered the fray. O'Leary presided over huge public meetings held throughout Cork County, particularly in Clonakilty, where his jostles with Ben Jones attained legendary status, and he followed up his attack in a series of articles to the Contemporary Review that even impressed Gladstone, who congratulated him on his brilliant indictment of Irish landlordism. Many of Ben Jones' labourers who refused to work for him during the boycott were evicted, but were provided with houses and employment by the Land League, at least in the short term. By January 1881, Ben Jones had fled to London, leaving his son Willie in charge. His tenants maintained a fairly united resistance until well after the passing of the 1881 Land Act, when they could enter the land court to obtain a judicial determination for fair rents. While preparing to return to Lissalan, Ben Jones fell suddenly ill at his London home and died on the 22nd of June, 1882. The estate then passed to Ben Jones' eldest son, Willie, but within a year, tragedy struck when he was killed in a shooting accident. This was followed by the loss of the youngest daughter, Philippa, two years later in 1885. Having lost her husband and two children within the space of three years, Ben Jones' wife, Caroline, who was considered a very kindly and decent woman, passed away in 1886. The estate passed to her son, Reginald, the last member of the Benz Jones family to run the Lissalan estate. You have just heard about William Benz Jones of Lissalan. However, an even more prominent and famous man lived in Lissalan subsequently. That was Charles R. Stanley, who purchased the estate in 1929. Known to everyone by his initials CO, Mr. Stanley was one of the leading figures in the industrial and commercial life of Britain and Ireland for much of the 20th century. The purpose of this talk is to give a brief outline of his life. He was born in Capaquin County, Wardford in 1899 and lived there until his late teens when he and his family left for London. After a very brief career in teaching, he worked in advertising and this brought him into contact with the Pi Electronics Company, a small business based in Cambridge. It was mainly involved in the production of radios, then an industry in its infancy. C.O. Stanley purchased the company in 1928, and under his leadership, Pi quickly expanded and became a significant player in the radio manufacturing market, at a time when the sale of radios was increasing rapidly. C.O. Stanley was one of the first people to recognize the enormous potential of the radio industry. He foresaw the day when every household would have at least one radio. In addition, as the 1930s went on, his company devoted huge resources to developing commercially viable television sets. Again, he was one of the first people to see the vast potential of television. In the late 1940s, his engineers were to the forefront in developing a special valve, known as an EF50, that was being produced to revolutionize the quality of television pictures. When World War II broke out in 1939, all television broadcasts in the UK were suspended for the duration of the war. Far from being a disaster for Pi, 
the outbreak of war actually heralded the beginning of a golden new era for the company. This happened because it soon became clear that the technology involved in producing the EF-50 valve was also of immense importance in the production of the radar defense systems that were to play such an important role in the successful defense of Britain against the supposedly unbeatable German Air Force. Suddenly, C.O. Stanley and his company found themselves at the heart of Britain's war effort. The Pie Factory in Cambridge, as well as other rented factory premises, were working to full capacity on a 24-hour day, seven days a week basis, mainly manufacturing vital communications and defence equipment for the British forces. C.O. Stanley became one of the best known men in Britain. In 1943, his significant role in the successful war effort was recognised when he was awarded an OBE, and later a CBE. Listing all of the achievements of the Pie Company would be a time-consuming task. Briefly, however, it is necessary to mention that Pi was the company that developed the first transistor radio. It provided the British police force with properly functioning and efficient radio telephones. It equipped the British Army with mobile telephones. It developed underwater cameras, often successfully used in locating sunken air and sea craft. And it led to the production of colour television sets. After the war, C.O. Stanley devoted much of his energy and attention to establishing independent television in Britain. Throughout the early 1950s, he almost single-handedly led the fight against the broadcasting monopoly enjoyed by the BBC. His aim was to establish an independent television service. The battle to realise his ambition was intense, encountering many obstacles and placing C.O. at the very centre of media attention in Britain. Against the odds, he triumphed and ITV was successfully launched in 1957. The venture benefited both Pi and CO in financial terms to a very significant degree. One of the more curious activities that CO Stanley and his company engaged in was in secretly financing the pirate radio station Radio Caroline. By broadcasting from a ship moored off the mainland, Radio Caroline was able to get around the legal requirements of having to secure a broadcasting license. C.O. Stanley saw that a popular radio station like Radio Caroline would have a huge audience, especially among young people. This would mean a surge in demand for radios and transistors. Pi would benefit from that. Once again, he was proved right. Pirate radio became extremely popular in Britain in the 1960s, and just as Stanley had predicted, this resulted in massive sales of radios and transistors. Such was the prominence of Pi in the electronics world that C.O. Stanley was named as Businessman of the Year in Britain, and in 1957 he was presented with a prestigious award by the Duke of Edinburgh in recognition of the quality of Pi's radios and television sets. C.O. Stanley did not confine his business interests to Britain. He also acquired numerous businesses in the United States and Australia, among other places. In Ireland, by the 1960s, through his ownership of controlling interests in companies such as Sunbeam Woolsey, Yall Carpets, Unidare and many more, he was actually the largest employer in the state outside of the government. And this substantial involvement in Irish industry brought him into direct contact with leading political figures, and among those who counselled him as both a friend and advisor were Sean Lamass. Despite this level of access to the top of politicians, CO was unsuccessful in his plans to establish a national television service in Ireland. Instead, the government, after delaying for many years, opted for a state-owned service, RTE. C.O. Stanley's contribution to Irish industry was recognised when Trinity College Dublin awarded him an honorary law degree in 1960. It was the first time that Trinity College had awarded such a degree to anybody other than an academic. It was a unique honour and one that C.O. Stanley treasured very much. He proudly wore his Trinity tie practically every day for the rest of his life. Stanley was a master of the art of advertising and publicity. One prime example of this came in 1953. He equipped Sir John Hunt's Everest expedition with Pi radios, which enabled the members of the expedition to communicate with each other. A photo of one of the successful climbers on Everest with a Pi radio was widely used by CO in a publicity blitz afterwards. The conquering of Mount Everest coincided with the coronation of Queen Elizabeth in May 1953. This presented C.O. Stanley's company with another golden opportunity to gain publicity because Pi provided the only colour television coverage of this momentous event. Meanwhile, the BBC could only provide black and white pictures. It was a masterstroke by C.O. Stanley and it was the spark that ignited public debate about the merit of colour television. C.O. Stanley's stature in Britain was such that members of the royal family regularly accepted invitations to view the latest developments at the Pi factory. Pi, with C.O. Stanley still very much in control, seemed destined to remain at the forefront of the electronics world as the 1960s dawned. However, just as spectacularly as they had reached the top, 
they fell from grace. Probably due to overconfidence after decades of continuous success, they failed to fully appreciate the dangers posed by superior quality imported radios and television sets from Germany and the Far East. Quite suddenly, Pi equipment was surpassed by others in terms of quality and performance. Sales collapsed and so did the company's share price. On the 17th of November 1966, a creditors meeting effectively brought an end to the Pi Electronics Company. The collapse of Pi and its subsequent takeover by its Belgian rival Philips was the most dramatic event of the business world in Britain in 1966. It attracted enormous publicity and unfortunately criticism of the leadership of C.O. Stanley. After over a quarter of a century at the very centre of the electronics industry, it was a humiliating end to the business career of C.O. Stanley and his son John. C.O. suffered another personal blow in the mid-1960s when he became embroiled in a local controversy. From the time of his acquisition of the original Lisalan estate in 1929, he had bought many adjoining farm holdings as they came on the market. His wealth enabled him to pay whatever was the going rate, and even more in some cases. The result was that the estate had grown to around 800 acres. The Bishop of Cork and Ross, Dr. Cornelius Lucy, raised the issue of ownership of such a substantial holding by one person and suggested that it was unfair to local small farmers as they could not possibly compete with a wealthy individual. The controversy gained widespread publicity when CO's wife, Velma, wrote letters to a local newspaper, defending her husband's activity and pointing out what a good employer he had always been, as well as being a generous donor to many local charities and deserving causes. Despite her well-founded arguments, the Land Commission intervened and used its powers to acquire a large part of the estate and distribute it among local farmers. After the collapse of his business empire, CO spent more and more time in Ireland, and following the death of his wife Velma in 1970, he lived almost exclusively in Lisalan. There, he lived out his life in quiet seclusion, though he maintained a strong interest in the substantial farming operation that was run by the staff that he employed. Animals owned by C.O. Stanley were regular winners at agricultural shows throughout West Cork over many decades. He had a strong interest in breeding the very best quality animals, with the British Frisian being one of his favourites. His interest in high quality livestock was shown by his generous sponsorship of the award for overall champion animal at Clannacilty Show each year. The C.O. Stanley Cup was one of the most prestigious awards available to cattle breeders. C.O. suffered from Alzheimer's disease in his later years. He died suddenly but peacefully on the morning of January 19, 1989, while preparing breakfast. His death was the cause of immense sadness in the wider Clannacilty area, where he was always known as a good employer and a generous benefactor to many charitable causes. He was buried in the nearby Kilmaluda Church graveyard alongside his beloved wife, Velma. This is the crossroads of Bala Onafran, meaning the town or way of the mass. It may refer to the penal chapel on the hill behind us that collapsed in 1798, or to the early medieval church that lay ahead at the end of this green and overgrown pathway. This old mass path, with a stream crossing by way of stepping stones, leading to Kilgallop Church and Graveyard, was used by generations of Tonakilty people on their way to Sunday Mass. It would also have carried horses and carts bearing coffins for burial. As we enter this early medieval ecclesiastical site of Kilgariff, we are stepping back in time, perhaps a thousand years or more. There are centuries of burials here in Kilgariff from Chalakilty town and surrounding districts. Under every stone and mound lie mortal remains, including those of Catholic, Protestant, and dissenter. They range from clergy, merchants, and large farmers, whose finding resting places are marked by engraved tombs and headstones, as you can see, to smallholders, laborers, and paupers, who sleep beneath these scattered stones in unmarked graves. The first mention of an Anglo-Normal settlement in Donnacilty was in this historic place, then referred to as Keeley or Keeley Cofty. In 1292, Thomas de la Roche received a charter from King Edward I to hold a market on every Monday at Keeley Coffee. And that is how Clannacilty began as a trading town. 
this old church may have predated De La Roche, as one of the advantages in getting a charter was the presence of a church. It is similar in size to the ruined churches in nearby Ballon Temple and Temple Quindlen, being about 40 feet long and 20 feet wide. However, there is a difference. The walls here appear to be much thicker and the stone used was of a rougher type, which may suggest that it predates the other two churches. At 40 feet by 20, this church seems extremely small, but this may not have always been the case. Early Christian architecture was composed of three separate sites. The first was the church, defined by its altar. The second was a martyr's chapel, founded on relics. And the third was the baptistry, centered on the baptismal font. Kevin Whelan captures this in his scholarly work, Religion, Landscape and Settlement in Ireland, and gives the example of the 6th century site excavated by John Sheehan at Cahala Highland in County Kerry. From the Middle Ages, ecclesiastical buildings combined the three sites into one single building that we are familiar with today. It is not certain when worship ceased at this church. A new Anglican church was built by Richard Boyle in 1613, so it is unlikely that Protestants worshipped here after that time. It is also open to question as to whether Catholic ceremonies were held here up to and including the 1600s. The penal system started well before 1691 with the enactment of laws establishing the Anglican religion as a state religion and denying Catholics of all religious worship and freedom of expression. It is the early 1750s before we find another reference to a Roman Catholic church or chapel in Clonakilty. That was perhaps the penal chapel on Old Chapel Lane that collapsed during the celebrations mass in 1798. The parish priest in 1750 was Father Daniel O'Donovan, who was appointed in 1746, and he is believed to be the first parish priest in the modern parish of Clonakilty. The remains of Father Daniel O'Donovan, who died in 1776, were buried in this tomb. Prior to his appointment as parish priest in 1746, Father Daniel had been pastor or curate to his uncle, Father Rickard O'Donovan, who had been parish priest in Balnascarty for many years, up to the time of his death in 1746. Father Rickard was the son of Daniel O'Donovan, Member of Parliament for Baltimore in the Parliament of James II. Ralph Clear, Provost of Bandon, reporting to his bishop in 1743, boasted that there were no priests or papists within the town of Bandon. Referring to eight popish priests residing outside the district, he reported Rickard O'Donovan, reputed vicar general of the Diocese of Ross in the county of Cork, resides at Banniscarthy, about five miles from the town. We have no evidence that Father Rickard is buried in this tomb, as the inscription only refers to his nephew. Here lieth the body of the Reverend Daniel O'Donovan, who was pastor of this parish 30 years and departed this life April 1776. Requiescat in pace. Nestling in the grove, within a few feet of Father Daniel O'Donovan's tomb, we find the final resting place of Timothy Deasy, his wife Hannah, and seven of their nine children. Prior to her marriage, Hannah D.C. was Hannah O'Donovan, a member of the same family as fathers Rickard and Daniel O'Donovan. So it was from the O'Donovans and not the D.C.'s that the name Rickard was introduced to the family. D.C. family members amassed fortunes, leading highly successful and colorful lives as smugglers and traders on the high seas. Later, as brewers, DC's brewery in Clonakilty was the biggest employer in the town for decades. The story of the brewery is well documented, but it may have had a different ending if a plot hatched in 1809 had reached fruition. 
Timothy Deasy, who was born about 1839, held an estate of 3,000 acres at Fail Court near Ballinine. He bequeathed a life interest in that estate to his son, also named Timothy, and in succession to Timothy's firstborn male issue. In the event of no male issue being born, the estate was to revert to Timothy's younger brother, Rickard D.C. Timothy married Anna Maria Barry about 1780, and they lived in Bristol and other parts of Gloucestershire. After 19 years, there was no issue, and Rickard quit Ireland to live in Bristol to follow through on his inheritance. In 1809, Timothy Deasy announced the birth of a son, which aroused grave suspicion in his brother Rickard, who began extensive investigations. In 1812, Rickard interrogated Timothy's doctor in Bristol, but the doctor heightened suspicion when he refused to speak about the matter. After much mystery and intrigue, a subsequent court case revealed that Timothy and Anna Maria Deasy had forced a girl named Mary Doland to leave her employment and induced her to become pregnant. In 1809, she gave birth to a baby boy and she was prevailed upon to surrender all rights of motherhood to Timothy and Anna Maria Deasy. The child was baptized Edward Garrett Deasy at Clifton, Gloucester on the 28th of September, 1809. Were it not for the cunning and intuition of Rickard D.C., this child, Edward Garrett D.C., would have changed the course of Clannacilty history. Here at the foot of the Great Ash Tree is a memorial vault to heroic Catholic priests who secretly and courageously performed their priestly duties during penal times, despite the constant threat of arrest, persecution, and death. Father Daniel O'Sullivan was appointed parish priest at Kilmean and Castle Ventry around 1700. Like Father Richard O'Donovan, he was unable to live in his parish, as we learn from the Anglican bishop who visited Kilmean in 1700 and reported, the parish priest Daniel O'Sullivan lives in another parish. He generally serves mass in a ditch, sheltered by sods, or sometimes in a cabin. Father Daniel, who was born at Castle Ventry, was a member of the O'Sullivan Bond family, who lived there for generations. Father Daniel O'Sullivan died on the 22nd of July, 1723, and is interred in this tomb. The inscription on his tomb is in Latin, and it reads, Eu Yacet Hic Daniel, Divino Jura Sacratos, Kilminia Pastor, Popper Ebus Pater, Religiosus Arat, in Ula Pietate Fecundus, Celo Animus, in Vida Fama, Perinus Erit. And he died on the 22nd of July, 1723. But Father Daniel O'Sullivan is not the only priest from the O'Sullivan Bond family born in this house in Castle Ventry to be interred in this tomb. After his death, he was replaced by Father Marty O'Sullivan, who was no relation. After Father Marty came, Reverend Father Dennis O'Sullivan, born of Castle Ventry, and his nephew, Father Jeremiah O'Sullivan, who was recorded as being curate in 1770. Two years later, in November 1772, both O'Sullivan clerics became martyrs for their faith when they were savagely slaughtered by a priest-killing monster at a crossing on the Allegheny River. The exact circumstances of their deaths were not documented at the time, but it is believed that the parish priest Father Dinnis was on his way from Castle Ventry to Rossmore to St. Mass. Using the most direct route, he prepared to cross the Allegheny River at Bale the Hydra, when he was pounced upon by his notorious killer. When Father Dinnis didn't arrive in Rossmore, his nephew, Father Jeremiah naturally became concerned, and he set out to look for his uncle. As he reached this point, a later known as Bale of Dossagert, he happened upon and surprised the murderer, who was in the process of committing the foul deed. Having viciously killed the elderly parish priest, he then seized Father Jeremiah and murdered him as well, 
Then, as the river flowed calmly on through the fertile Argadine Valley, it is said that the water turned red with the blood of the two martyred priests. In the southeastern corner of the graveyard, there partly stands what was once a splendid memorial erected to the memory of John Murray Tolineski, who died in 1813. It was commissioned by his sons, Father Dennis and Father Thomas Murray, and their brother, Mr. John Murray. Father Thomas was recorded as being the oldest priest in Ireland at the time of his death in May 1891. During the 1800s, John Murray, the priest's brother, was one of the leading general merchants in Clannacilty Town, trading in Main Street in what is now Ross Street. John Murray played a leading role in the civic life of the town and was chairman of the town commissioners from 1846 to 1849. When he died in 1861, the business passed to his son-in-law, Callaghan McCarthy, who was born in 1826 of the most prominent family of the district in a house in Ballincorsi, Timaleek. McCarthy, who expanded the business on Main Street, was also a landlord at Dunwarley. In December 1886, he felt obliged to write to the Cork Examiner defending his treatment of his tenants against allegations from the Barrylow Land League who alleged his dealings were inhumane. He played a central role in the commercial and civic life of the town, and he was elected chairman of the town commissioners from 1869 to 1870. Callan McCarthy lived in the elaborate setting of Bushmount House and Gardens, just outside the town. He served as president of the local branch of St. Vincent de Paul, and often through the grounds of his magnificent Bushmount home, open to the public for charitable purposes. In 1901, he sold his business on Main Street to John Atkins Dunmanway. It was at Bushmount that Callan McCarthy died on the 2nd of June 1902, and he was buried with his wife Margaret and her Murray family here in Kilgariff. The inscription on the tomb read, Family Monument was erected in March 1843 by Reverend Dr. Thomas Murray and Dennis Murray and Mr. John Murray in memory of their dear and good father. Mr. Thomas Murray of Tolineski, who died June 26, 1843, and to the memory of Mr. John Murray and his beloved ch Another inscription reads, Mary Madeline McCarthy, who died April 19, 1939. And further inscriptions, in loving memory of Dr. Jeremiah Cotter Cock, who died the 12th of August, 1915. On his soul, sweet Jesus, have mercy. And in loving memory of Mrs. Mary Cotter Clonakilty, who died 13th of August, 1930. Sacred Heart of Jesus, have mercy on her. And two further inscriptions, erected to the memory of Margaret McCarthy, Nee Murray, wife of Callaghan McCarthy Clonakilty, who died July 23rd, 1893 and of Callaghan McCarthy Bushmount Clonakilty, who died June 2nd, 1902. Time has taken a severe toll on this memorial, but the burial place remains as charming and tranquil as it was over 200 years ago. The Southern Star of the 21st of July, 1894, reported on how a young barrister named Francis A. Anglin from Toronto visited the home of his father in Clonakilty and stayed with his aunt, Mrs. O'Brien, on the Western Road. The visitor, Francis Alexander Anglin, came from one of Clonakilty's most celebrated and historic families. His father, Timothy Warren Anglin, was born to Francis Anglin and Johanna Warren in August 1822. The family home was at Myrtleville, now the parochial house. Timothy Warren Anglin was one of the leaders of the Young Ireland Movement in Clannacilty in 1848, but immigrated to Canada in the immediate aftermath. He became editor of the Freeman newspaper in New Brunswick, 
which made him an influential voice in the colony. In 1867, Anglin was elected to the House of Commons of Canada and made such an impact that seven years later, the Prime Minister, Alexander Mackenzie, nominated him as Speaker of the House of Commons. When he retired from politics, Anglin moved to Toronto, where he was editor of the Toronto Tribune, and it was there that he died in May 1896. The Southern Star report from 1894 informs us that during his visit, Francis Alexander Anglin visited Kilgariff Cemetery, where the bones of his ancestors for generations have been laid to rest. His memories of dark and evil times and the history of his country were revived and recalled when he read on a tombstone there of the burial in 1785 of one of his patriot forefathers. Francis Alexander Anglin had a most distinguished legal career and was Chief Justice of Canada between 1924 and 1943. Jude O'Brien, who was visited by the young Anglin in 1894, died herself within a year in March 1895. Another noteworthy inscription that stands out on this tomb is that of John Crowley, who died in 1931. His wife, Margaret, was a daughter of Jula Anglin. Crowley, who was a national school teacher, was prominent in many organizations, especially in Clonakilty Agricultural Show Society and the GAA. He was a founding member of the GAA club in 1887 and was later a player and an officer. He was a founding secretary of Clonakilty Show Society in 1901, a position he held until 1915. Here in the centre of the graveyard, we have a modest headstone to a very distinguished Clonakilty man, Dr. Patrick O'Hee. Patrick O'Hee was descended from Ty O'Hee of Ahamilla, who was dispossessed of his cattle and lands during the Cromwellian plantation. Patrick's father, also named Ty O'Hee, was wounded at the Battle of the Big Cross near Shannon Vale in 1798. Tygo He later opened a classical school in Shannon Square, now called Emmett Square, which Patrick attended before studying to become a medical doctor. Patrick O'He married Mary McCarthy, a sister to John McCarthy, who became Bishop of Cloyne in 1874. Apart from busy medical practice, he found time to immerse himself in the civic and cultural life of the town and was chairman of town commissioners from 1843 to 1846. Dr. Patrick O'Hee died on the 2nd of February, 1855. When his wife Mary died in October, 1888, she was laid to rest in the O'Hee burial pot within the idyllic setting of Timeleague Abbey. Patrick's son, Thomas O'Hee, was interred with his father in Kilgariff when he passed away in July at the age of 28 years in 1874. Thomas was married to Ellen M. Murray, the daughter of Timothy and Catherine Murray of the shipbuilding family from Ring. When she died in December 1902, it was with the Murray family that she was buried in Ballon Temple. The first two lines of this slab are clearly readable, which say, Here lieth Dr. Willem Callanan of Tanakilty, who died 4th of May, 1808. Unfortunately, it is not possible to read the remainder of the inscription, so we do not know who else is entombed here. Dr. Willem Callanan was born around 1733 at Ballymikyo in Tanakilty, where the Callanan family were hereditary physicians to the McCarthy Rebooks. After qualifying as a doctor, William Callanan lived at Mount Shannon, later called Skatok Cottage, which was later the site for the Convent of Mercy set up in 1856. Willem was also a merchant and owned stores in the Long Key area of Clonakilty. Even though he opposed the White Boys, he joined the secret organization, the United Irishmen, and became prominent in their ranks. His planned involvement in the rebellion of 1798 did not materialize, yet he was still involved in 1803 on the morning of Emmett's Rising in Dublin 
Calendon's house in Tarnakilty was visited by Lieutenant Douglas, accompanied by Thomas Hungerford of the island and Reverend William Stewart of Kilgariff. They arrested the doctor, his son, and his guest of eight months, William Todd Jones, and conveyed them to Cork Jail. When William died in 1808, his former comrade in arms, Padraig O. Oscoli of Arfield, and who fought at the Battle of the Big Cross, was very sorry to hear that Dr. Calnan is no more but is exceedingly happy to learn that he has died in the bosom of the Catholic Church. With his departing spirit has fled all that remains of humanity, national liberty, and genuine patriotism, which that part of Ireland could boast of. Dr. William Cannon's grandson was the eminent religious painter, Alfred Elmore, who was born at Tony in 1815. Like many great Irish people, the English claimed him as one of their own. Of Elmore's 1839 work, Christ Crucified, the art journal remarked that if this artist progresses as he has commenced, we shall ere long add another name to our limited list of great English masters. At one time, Elmore was accused of being anti-Catholic, but some critics dismissed that as Daniel O'Connell was the patron of Elmore's masterpiece, The Martyrdom of Thomas a Becket. Alfred Elmore died in January 1881 and was buried in Kinsale Green Cemetery in London. Today we are visiting the coastal village of Ring and the ancient graveyard at Bellin Temple both which are in the ecclesiastical parishes of Clonakilty and Dowra. Bellin Temple Graveyard is located about five kilometres from Clonakilty town, overlooking the village of Ring and Clonakilty Bay. Dowra Catholic Church and Clonakilty Agricultural College are close by to the north of here. The building of the church was completed in 1897 and it is the third church to be built on or adjacent to the present site. The first church existed towards the end of the 18th century. It had a thatched roof and the congregation knelt on the floor. On Sunday, the 21st of May, 1796, it is recorded that Father Richard Roach, the Catholic curate from Clonakilty, was knocked off his horse by a group of white boys in front of the gates of Dara Church. He had denounced the group's activities in the parish from the pulpit the previous Sunday. He was saved from serious injury or perhaps a worse fate by the timely intervention of a number of local women who surrounded and shielded the fallen priest. The origins of Clonakilty Agricultural College, known locally as Darra College, dates back to 1905. The deceased owner of the 354-acre farm, Mr. Daniel O'Leary, had willed his property to two trustees, one of whom was the parish priest of Clonakilty, the other being the Bishop of Ross. Mr. O'Leary's express wishes were that it should be used for educational and charitable purposes. Subsequently, the two clergymen leased the entire property to the Department of Agriculture to set up a training school for young farmers. The coming of the Normans in 1169 was a momentous event that changed the history of Ireland and brought about the gradual decline of the old Gaelic order. In the aftermath of the Norman conquest, the lands of Ring and adjoining townlands were confiscated from the McCarthy Reba clan and came into the possession of the Arundel family, who in turn were subject to the new overlords the Barrymore in this part of West Cork. Arundel built a castle on the hill overlooking the bay. Ring Harbour became known as Arundel Haven because of its sheltered aspect and the village was known as Arundel Mills due to the large milling enterprise that was carried on there. I can recall when Ring was a thriving port right up to the 1960s. Cargoes of coal, fertilizer, and timber were unloaded at the pier for Clonakilty merchants and local creameries. Brightest from the mines at Dunmore, 
and agricultural produce were the chief exports from this port in the 19th and 20th century. The fertile sandy soil to be found in this area was, and still is, famous for consistently producing the first crop of early potatoes each year for the Dublin market. Before the advent of the railway, it was expensive to get to the Dublin market. The round trip of a sloop with 50 to 60 tons of potatoes cost anywhere between 30 and 40 guineas. The trade was risky and unpredictable at the best of times, being wholly dependent on weather and market forces. During the rebellion of 1798, sloops loaded with potatoes that had left ring bound for the Dublin market were seized off the coast of Wexford by the Irish rebels. Compensation for the loss of the potatoes was sought from the authorities by the merchants following the rising. The Coast Guard station was situated across the road from the pier. It consisted of five two-storey houses, a boathouse and a watch house. It had quite a checkered history, having been raided for weapons by the IRA during the War of Independence and later being burned to the ground. It is believed to have been built in the 1820s to combat the wholesale smuggling that took place along the southwestern seaboard of County Cork. A number of prominent families in this area, both Protestant and Catholic, ran a highly organised smuggling ring with links to Britain and the continent and especially to France. Families such as the Deasys and Suttons from Clonakilty and the Austins from Ring House, while across the bay the Galways and the Hungerfords all owned their own boats and took an active part in this lucrative trade. A little further on in the centre of the village are the ruins of what was originally a large three-storey slated grain store, believed to have been built sometime in the 1500s. It housed hundreds of tons of wheat for milling into flour. To the rear of the adjacent bridge can still be seen signs of a mill race used by the milling concern and on the higher ground is a splendid dwelling house where once stood a substantial mill. This house most appropriately named Arundel Mills. Here in the village of Ring on St Stephen's Night 1922 an incident occurred during the Civil War that left one Free State soldier dead and a member of the anti-treaty side seriously wounded. One of the most famous freedom fighters in the War of Independence in West Cork was Clannacilty man John Flyer Nine. His daring exploits and bravery are still part of the folklore, along with that of his great friends James Spud Murphy and Tom Barry, commanding officer of the Flying Column of the 3rd Cork Brigade. On that fateful night, Flyer and some of his friends had called to a public house and ring for some refreshments. Word of their presence was quickly communicated to the Free State Army garrisoned in Clannacilty. Two lorry loads of soldiers quickly arrived and surrounded the building. They burst in the front door, firing their guns as they did so. Flyer was hit in the chest, the bullet lodged near his spine to remain there for the rest of his life. Although wounded, Flyer shot out the light overhead and in the darkness and confusion managed to escape out the back door. He was hit several more times, but succeeded in getting away. He was still recovering in Bandon Nursing Home when the Civil War finally came to an end several months later. In the firing in the public house, a Free State soldier named Private Michael MacDonald from Turles was fatally wounded. Both Flyer and another Republican fighter, Tom Lane, a native of Arfield, were later arrested in May 1924 and charged on a number of murder counts, including that of the death of the soldier. They appeared in court in Clannacilty, where a strong military and police presence was evidence about the town and outside of the courthouse. All charges against both men were subsequently dropped through lack of evidence. Flyer emigrated to Scotland since there were few job opportunities in the Free State and much less simply for those who a short time previously had held opposite political views. He was returning home for Christmas of 1933 when he picked up a cold on the ferry crossing. This developed into pneumonia from which he died on the 6th of January 1934. He was buried in Ballymoney Cemetery 
not far from the ancestral home of the Nyans. The small single arch bridge in the center of ring also has a bit of history of its own. It crosses over an inlet of Clonakin TB, which is a very important ecological site, constituting both a special protection area and a special area of conservation. It is believed to date from the late 18th century. During the War of Independence, the local people altered the bridge by cutting trenches with picks and shovels so that the raiding lorries of the Black and Tans and British military, which are garrisoned in the nearby town of Clonakilty, could not cross over it. However, the trenches were cut in such a way that the bridge was passable to someone on horseback or with a donkey and cart. The road would also have been trenched at the Pound Cross, so that if the Tans wanted to raid Southwing, they would have had to walk miles, something they would be very reluctant to do. The locals also had a very unusual method of warning people of the imminent approach of Crown forces. When the lorries were leaving Clonakilty to raid along the coast at Barrero, they would be seen on the road to a ring. Local volunteers on watch on Ashgrove Hill immediately lit a fire. This was seen by people on top of Ballymac William Hill, who in turn lit their fire. Likewise, on top of Griffin's Hill, and so on along the hills to Barrero and Cork McSherry. It was an early warning system that gave volunteers some time to make their getaway or find safe hiding places. Rain seldom if ever affected this method since the Crown forces rarely ventured out in bad weather in their open top lorries. The ruined church here in Ballon Temple Graveyard is often referred to as Temple O'Malis, or Temple O'Malisa, meaning the Church of the Servant of God. It has also been referred to as Antomplin Whale, or the Bare Little Church. As you can see, the ruin is of a rectangular structure running from east to west, with the main entrance on the southern side. It measures about 50 feet from east to west and about 20 from north to south. The eastern and western walls are almost entirely collapsed. There is a square window in the west gable and also the remains of a narrow doorway. We know that this church had a gallery since four corbels are visible in the north wall. There is a water font in the eastern wall and also what appears to have been a baptismal bowl near the ground close to the western wall. It is not known if this church was sacked at the time of the Reformation during the reign of King Henry VIII but an account exists that states it was burnt down in 1615 and afterwards was allowed to fall into disrepair. Some sources claim the church was burned by the people themselves. They were so incensed at their church being taken from them, they would not let anyone else worship there either. It is also said that mass was frequently celebrated in secret in the church ruins during penal times. This is understandable since the commanding view from here over the surrounding countryside would give the priest and the people ample time to escape. Local folklore has handed down through generations the story of the shaking tree at a local crossroads. A priest was captured in this locality during penal times and there and then, without trial, was hanged from a tree at this point. Ever afterwards, the leaves on this tree shook even on the calmest of days and thus originated its name of the Shaking Tree Crossroads. Although new graves are no longer available here in Ballon Temple, burials to family plots still take place. Headstones date from the early 1800s, but there are many unmarked graves. In famine times, it is said that countless numbers of people from Barrero, Argehan, and Balanglana were buried here oftentimes in secret in the dead of night. Many of the victims came from small farmer and fishing backgrounds. Though there was an abundance of fish in the sea, it became a vicious circle. Since the people had become so weak from hunger, they were unable to put their boats to sea. In some instances, fishermen used their boats as firewood and sold their nets to buy food. In the decade of the famine, the population of Darren Ring fell by over 40%, in contrast to 26% for the whole of County Cork. 
However, the townland of Concombeg suffered a loss of almost 70% between the years of 1841 and 1851, and the town of Arundel Mills, which is known today as Ring Village, suffered a loss of almost 60%. Research has shown that disease and pestilence cause as many deaths as hunger and starvation, but we can never know the actual numbers or real extent of the suffering of the victims. This graveyard is the final resting place of Taig O'Donovan Osna, the leader of the United Irishmen at the Battle of the Big Cross, which took place on the 19th of June, 1798. This battle has gone down in history as the only recorded engagement between United Irishmen and the Crown forces to occur in the whole of Munster during that historic year. Tighe was reputed to have had a secret hiding place to store the pikeheads for which were fashioned by local blacksmiths. This hiding place or dugout is also believed to have been used to conceal weapons during the War of Independence. It was discovered by a local person about 20 years ago and appears to be still in as good a condition as it was more than 200 years ago. Ballon Temple Graveyard is also the burial place of one of Ring's most influential but little known families, the Austins of Ring House. In 1840, William Austin established a box making factory in Ring, adjacent to where Ring House stands today. Earlier, from his factory in England, he had patented the safety match. Match boxes and pill boxes were the principal lines produced at Ring. When the factory closed down in the 1880s, it had 60 women and 12 men on its payroll, and its loss was a severe blow to the economy of Ring and the surrounding area. Towards the end of the 18th century, the port at Ring was so successful to the detriment of neighboring ports that in 1786, and here I quote from the Hibernian Chronicle, a mob of ruffians were dispatched to Ring in the dead of night by unscrupulous merchants residing in the towns of Kinsale and Bandon. They burned the mills and warehouses and even bored the schooners anchored in the bay, cutting down the masts of several of them. Much damage and expense was caused to the industry and hard work of this busy port and its people." Unquote. However, apparently this attack did not have a lasting effect since we find that Samuel Lewis, writing in 1837, stated that the port of Ring exports annually 5,000 bushels of wheat, 1,000 tons of potatoes, and large quantities of slate, which is of a superior quality and well regarded. In the mid-1800s, one of the Austin family from Ring House came up with a novel idea. He had a number of large iron rings inserted in the rocks at the side of the channel so that the ships could haul themselves up or down the channel regardless of the wind. Instead of a number of boats waiting outside the harbour mouth for wind and tide to turn in their favour, they could now get up the channel regardless, but at a price. The Austins charged one shilling for the use of each ring. In a short time, they became very wealthy. The Austins intermarried with the Barretts of Ring and the Gilmans of Yaha Road. But apart from this, they seem to remain entirely English, no doubt due to the constant business activities with their English cousins. In 1874, a bitter quarrel split the family. In that year, William Austin II remarried. His second wife was a local girl who worked in the house as a maid by name of Joanne Barry from Rock Savage. This lady was a Catholic and William was forced to leave Ring House to go live in a small cottage that stood on the original site of Castle Arundel. They had three children, including a boy named Joseph, who went to America at a young age. His son, Albert, was to become vice president of a huge global commercial concern, the Container Company of America. Ring has had a remarkable, turbulent history from the earlier times of the O'Driscolls and the O'Cowigs to the coming of the Normans and the subsequent continued conflict through the centuries from foreign invasion and inter-tribal rivalry 
It is a place rich in culture and heritage as well as in history, and is one of the most serene and picturesque places to be found anywhere along the south coast of Ireland. A walk or a drive to the top of Castle Hill or Fortune Hill and look out over Clonakilty Bay and across to Inchidonny Island, which confirm why the Arundels chose to build their castle in this part of West Cork so many years ago.